Tonight, my sermon, uh, I want to challenge you a little bit. Can you put my sermon up there, maybe? No? Yeah. Uh, you know, I've been conflicted uh, all day yesterday and this morning about what to talk about today regarding this topic. All I know is I've, I know the Bible verse I'm supposed to share with you. So uh, I've put some notes around it and uh, spent probably more time today preparing for this sermon than I have for a long time, preparing for a sermon, and got in here this morning and still wasn't exactly sure what direction we were going to go in. So um, I guess we'll find out when we get there, won't we? Um, let me know. Is my head still in the... A little bit. Apparently. Well, that, that doesn't count. Is that? The only thing that counts is the green. So. We're good. My head's good. Okay, so... Um, Living by grace for God. Uh, a comment was made yesterday morning that just sort of resonated with what God had been telling me to talk about. And uh, in a Bible study on Saturday morning, we have a men's Bible study. And I was pleasantly surprised. I went there yesterday, and there was, what, 20-some people there. Um, that was pretty exciting. And I know, like, 15 of them have to be there or more, but there was other people that didn't have to be there um, that were at the Bible study. And uh, one of the comments was made is, uh, reminded me of living in grace and understanding the power and authority that we get when we live in grace and the freedom there is in grace and you know, you know how people are afraid to grace is a really scary thing for a lot of people because if you give people grace then they'll, they'll think they can get away with murder, you know what I mean they'll think they can get away with all kinds of stuff and I'll be blunt with all of you. I, you know, for years I've struggled with that because if you teach people grace and to live in grace, um, they sort of cast off all the strength <coughs> and they they sort of rationalize behavior. And you know, God gave me grace. So, but those people that do that are not real believers. And I'm going to show you today um, that. And maybe, how many of you guys were there at the beginning when you learned about grace? And you're like, ooh, grace, I, I mean, I can do things that's not really going to affect my salvation. And, well, this is fun. How many of you guys ever thought that? And then you just sort of tried to see if it was going to affect your salvation or not. So a few, a few honest people. Thank you for being honest. Um, and uh, what we find out quickly is that's exactly the case, that... You know, you can live in grace and God gives us grace. Because if it was, if once we gave our life to Jesus Christ we had to be perfect, well, we'd all have been done and God would kill us all, right? Because um, how many of you, since you've given your life to Christ, have been perfect? Very close. Yeah. <laughs> Sue's up here going. But his wife goes. <laughs> Some of us, you know, and the two, now I've gone out of them, now I've gone here too. But the two men that rose their hands there, God has given them women to, to be the little sense of reality they need. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> Can you hear me at all through this? No. Yeah. Well, you get something in front of your mouth. Um, I'm going to Project your voice. I could project my voice, but I was outside cutting grass all day yesterday, and I got here this morning, and it was like, Oh. Uh, so I'm not sure I can protect my voice very long. So let's try this out. Okay. That might be talentless. Try this out again. Is it working? It seems to be working now. Okay. So, um, you know, and, and the comment that was made yesterday that spurred my thoughts was when Jesus Christ gives our, when he washes us in the blood, and he sets us free. No longer are we in bondage to sin. And that freedom isn't like, now you don't have to worry about sin. Cool. The freedom is so that we can do the thing that we asked for the grace for in the first place. You're like, what's that thing? If you don't know what that thing is, we're in trouble. The, 
The fact that when I said that we could do, the grace is there so that we could do the thing that we said we wanted to do in the first place that we needed grace for. If you don't know what that thing is, then Christianity has just been indicted. American Christianity has just been indicted. And we're all in trouble. And that's the reason why I want to share the, the sermon today. Now when I tell you what that thing is, you're all going to be like, ah, well, I know that. I just wasn't thinking about it. Well, why weren't you thinking about it? It is the fundamental, most important thing of every one of our lives if we call ourselves Christian. And if you go a day without thinking about it, then you aren't the person that you think you are. We receive grace so that sin doesn't get in the way of accomplishing and experiencing that one thing that God created us for and that was to live for him and to bring him glory we talk about grace because everybody wants to paint our inadequacies with something that makes them go away right or at least makes them appear to go away so nobody can use them against me don't judge me But the fact is that grace is given to us and we're no longer in the bondage of sin. We don't have to worry about sin anymore. Not so that because it made us feel so bad about ourselves. Not because no longer will sin bring negative consequences. Because if you know anything about the grace of God, sin brings negative consequences whether you are a Christian or not. The grace of God is given to us so that the one thing that kept us from being with God is now removed. And I don't know how, but somehow, in our American society, we've turned Christianity into God gave us grace so we could feel better about ourselves. So that we're no longer in bondage to the the, the feelings of guilt that sin bring upon our lives. And, and we, we, we are so proud about that that we walk around in our society today, in church, and if someone points out our inadequacies and failures in love, we, we get angry and we get righteously indignant and say, don't judge me, don't tell me how to live my life. <laughs> Failing, and we quote scripture, God said, judge not must you be judged. And we quote that scripture out of context, not understanding what it really meant. And we don't quote the scriptures that say judge with the word. Did you know the Bible tells us to judge one another's actions? And we don't read those passages because we think that God gave us grace for our life experience. That God gave us this covering of the blood of Jesus so that we can feel good about our lives and so that we can live our lives out without any feelings of guilt or shame and we can just have a good life. And therefore, you will burn in hell. If you believe that, you're going to burn in hell and the pastors who told you that and let you sit in their churches and think that are going to be there with you. Because if you read your Bible in its entirety and understand the nature of God, the grace of G and the blood of Jesus Christ was so that we can run after God with all our heart, not encumbered by sin. Do you know how many passages are in the New Testament that say, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind? Over and over again, it says that. And it says it because you now do not you know how many times the Old Testament talked about doing wrong and making penance for what was wrong? And all of that's gone. You no longer have to worry about what you do or not in order to serve God. Now you can serve God. Let me give you another example of the Old Testament of, of this happening. If you were a priest, let's say you were a priest in the nation of Israel. If you wanted to go into the presence of God, you had to go through this whole ritual of purifying yourself. And here's the worst part. If it didn't work, you died. Mm -hmm. 
What do you mean? You have to go through this whole ritual of purifying yourself, your heart, your mind, your, your flesh, everything. And as you went into the Holy of Holies, if the purification didn't work, you died. And it was so much so they, they tied bells around your feet and a rope around your leg, and they pulled you out if you died. If the bell stopped ringing, they knew you were dead. And they couldn't go in and get you because they died too. Now, I'm, I'm telling you this little thing because I want you to understand something. The grace of Jesus, the, the blood of Jesus Christ and his grace wasn't so that you could run into the Holy of Holies and sin there. It was so that you didn't have to worry about being <laughs> pure all the time in order to be with God. How many of you, if I said, okay, guys, we're going to get into the presence of God, I hope you all prepared yourself, because if you didn't, you're going to die. Most of you would be like, I think I'm going to go to a different church. <laughs> the, the blood of Jesus and the grace of God eliminated that from the equation. Does that make sense? That no longer do we have to worry about being pure all the time. And, and, and we don't have to be focused on purity in order to be with God. Now we can just run with God because he's made us pure. Now, in that context, that statement is freeing. But what happens is we take it out of context... And we say, no longer do you have to worry about what you do and don't do. No longer do you have to worry about being judged, because judge not, lest you be judged. Now all you have to do is enjoy life. Love God and love others. And so we walk away. How many of you guys ever felt guilty about sinning and then realized it wasn't so bad? Nobody really tells, says anything to you. Especially at church. I mean, not unless you do one of the really bad things. You know what I mean? You know the bad ones. And we even have some churches where you could commit adultery and, and uh, decide to sleep with the lady across the, the congregation and show up next week with her and your kids and wife will be sitting over there and we won't say anything to you. Because God forbid we judge. I mean, it's like, really? Oh yeah, because the grace and mercy of God washes away all of our sins and we don't have to worry about it anymore. Ugh. This is what we've done in Christendom. And, and the danger isn't, listen folks, the danger is not that we have a bunch of people running around sinning, screwing up their lives. Oh, that's a danger, and that's bad. But, you know, whether or not they, they believed a false teaching of the Bible or not, doesn't change the fact that their life screwed up. I mean, you can have the blood of Jesus and cheat on your wife, and you're still going to get divorced, and you're still going to pay child support. And you're going to have no blood of Jesus and screw around on your wife. And you're still going to have divorce. And you're still going to have child support. The consequences of sin don't change whether you believe this false teaching or not. Your perceived life experience might change. And this is why it's so tantalizing. It's so titillating to the people in the world and in the church to believe this idea that I can go to church, I can be a per good person, and if I know about God and I, I believe in God and I believe that there's a Jesus and I believe he died on the cross and rose again on the third day, if I believe that, then now no one can judge me. And, and Jesus' blood has washed me clean and I don't have to worry about anything. And as long as I'm trying to be a good person and, and love God and love others, then I'm good. Man, that's a good, that's exciting. And I can go to church on Sunday mornings and I can be there for an hour, hour and a half and I can get involved in, a, in some kind of program where I feel like I'm being a part of the church and I can live my life any way I want as long as I don't break any major rules and if I do, no one's allowed to judge me and uh, I can just rebuild my life. I actually know women and men of God, quote, who decided that God would forgive them if they left their families and started with somebody else because God never wanted them to be miserable the rest of their life. Why would God want me to not be happy?
that is somebody who is worshiping a life experience, not worshiping God. You hear me? This is dangerous. The false teachings of the word is scary. And it's the reason why the church has no power. The, the, the church, the body of Christ, has no power. The people of God have absolutely no power except to fluff our pillows. What do you mean by fluff your pillows? I, I served in, before I started Bee Ministries, I served in several different churches for, for a period of years. And from the time I was 18, 19 years old, I, I ministered in church. And uh, when I was about early 20s, I started ministering on the platform in music. And I'm not, the only, I, I took 12 years of orchestra, played the French horn. That's my experience in, in music. And, and so I wasn't taught, I'm not learned on how to run a band or anything, but God just said, okay, here you go. And I started singing on a worship team. And, and it became very obvious that the whole point of church is to give people a shot in the arm of having a better life experience, encouraging them, making them feel good about themselves. It wasn't really about challenging people to grow with God. It wasn't about challenging people to think less of themselves and more of God. And that's the reason we started Bee Ministries. Because I was, I was really frustrated with it. Actually, I, I, I actually had arguments with the leaders of the church in private. I had, I had debate with the pastor of the church in private. And became very frustrated and decided, you know, and at one point he said to me, he goes, you know, you're right. You're absolutely right. But we have other things we need to worry about. And what he was saying was, Mike, what you're saying is biblical and it's absolutely right. But this is a church. And if these people leave,
Ah. The moment you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, God comes to you and wants to be with you. Now, how many of you guys know what God created the heavens and the earth and mankind for? Angie. Bring to bring glory to himself. Okay? So if the God who created the heavens and the earth and us to bring glory to himself, he finally gets in right relationship with you again, do you think he's going to ask you to do something? And what is the thing he's going to ask you to do? What is it going to accomplish? Bringing glory to himself. And as you were saying, it will bring you at oneness with God. If you obey. Now, how many of you guys have ever had a father, a good father, that you were allowed to disobey to his face? Was he a good father? No. Yes. My dad, if I disobeyed his, but even today, he might take me out in the name of Jesus. He's like, son, I haven't laid hands on anybody in a long time, but I'm going to lay hands on you now. Um, it's like, it's like, somebody's like, hey, Mike, do it. I want to see this. Anyways, um, Beth, put your hand down. Um, I, just, I just want you to think about this. If you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior today, do you think God is going to come to you and be with you and he's going to, you're going to feel his presence, you are. And then what's he going to do? He's going to require something of you. Why? Because this whole process isn't to make you comfortable. Now, how many of you guys have ever been uh, at one with God and God required something of you and you obeyed? Did it, was there a weird feeling about it? Was it fulfilling? Yeah, it was more fulfilling than anything. You're like, wow, that's really cool. And when you see God perform greater works than you could do by yourself through your simple obedience, you just sit there and you're like, whoa. I mean, it's like, and this is how God works. And this is what's freaky. God doesn't say, Mike, I want to take that speaker and put it in the hallway so that we can uh, speak the word to everybody in the mall. Oh, no, no, no. God will say, Mike, I'm going to put that speaker in the hallway so we can speak the word to everybody in the mall. Now, what I want you to do is I want you to go back there and uh, clean the toilet. Well, God, you said you wanted that done. Go back and clean the toilet. Well, I want to be a part of the people out there in the mall. <laughs> go clean the toilet. Well, I don't want to clean. <laughs> if you don't know, there's a toilet back here. I don't want to go back here and clean the toilet. <laughs> and when I come back, when I come back, the speaker's in the mall. And God's like, nice job. And I'm like, well, how'd that happen? And you realize that, were you guys able to hear the toilet flush? Yes. <laughs> that was the goal. And it's, God's going to ask you to do things that seem like they're totally irrelevant to what you think he's wanting to have accomplished. He wants you simply to obey him. And you're like, how many guys have ever, God's like, all right, we're going to move that out there, but I need you to clean the toilet. And you're like, well, I can't clean the toilet, God, because I'm not pure enough. <laughs> and all of a sudden you bring some sin up in your life that you have deemed more important than obeying God. But Jesus sent his only son to die on the cross to make that sin irrelevant. And now you're saying, but Jesus wasn't enough to make this irrelevant. This is really important. I can't obey you until I fix this. Now do you see why we don't see God move in our life? We don't see God power anymore? Because we, our mindsets are set. We've got to fix this. We've got to fix that. Folks, if you, I don't care if you were dealing drugs last night. And you got high. If you give your life to Jesus Christ right now, by the end of the day, he can perform his great works through your life. By the end of the day. He's not bound by our stupidity. And our justice. Now, the cops might show up at your house tomorrow and arrest you, and you might go to jail to start a prison ministry. But God will use you to do awesome works. 
This is, we don't, I want, I want to encourage you today. Turn your eyes and your heart to the Lord. Stop focusing on sin. Stop focusing on quality of life. And turn your eyes and your heart on the Lord. The Bible tells us that we are cursed when we turn our eyes, our affections, to something else than the Lord. I want you to imagine this. I want you to imagine God looking at you, loving you so much that he sent his only son to die for you. You accept his son so that you can be at one with God. And then God comes to you and says, I want to be with you. I'm accomplishing this great work. Come and join me. And you say to him, well, I've got, a, I've got some things that are really important. Can you help me fix those first? Where are your affections? On yourself and on other things. Your affections must be on the Lord. You have to put everything else in his hands. I get, being, I've been in youth ministry for, started when I was 18, 19 years old. So how long is that? I'm 43. Shut up. It's not 50 years. 24. I'm 43. I've, I've been in youth ministry for 24 years. I can't tell you how many times I've seen parents stop serving the Lord for their children. And I've watched their lives just, and their, their, their usefulness to God and the power of God in their life just go. <laughs> Folks, you can't fix your kids. You were, you were done training them when they were like 12. Okay? From the time they're 12 on, all you're trying to do is keep them from falling off the cliff. If you try to take control of their lives, they're going to despise you. You know what I mean? Why are your affections on your children? They're supposed to be on the Lord. I'm not saying you don't love your kids, folks. If you ever been around me, I get people accusing me of not loving my children. Anybody been in my house when my kids are around? Ever see me interact with my children? It's disgusting. I'm a big fat teddy bear. That's all I am. Okay? I absolutely love my children. But my affections are on the Lord. If my kids want, to, want me to pay attention to them, come, do what, come do, do what we're doing for the Lord. And they do. They're excited about it. Do you know why they're excited about it? Let me say, say this. Do you know why they're excited about it? Because they see the power of God. If you're not real and you're just doing things for your ministry for yourself so you can feel important, your kids are going to despise you. But when they see the power of God in your life, they're going to be like, yeah. I mean, I've had my kids say, Dad, how'd you do that? I don't know. I have no clue. I what do you mean you have no clue? I just showed up, said whatever God told me to say. Really? I mean, I could be stupid like you and God still use me? <laughs> Can I say amen? Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. That's, that's, a positive, that's a positive and encouraging word, Brother Shane. Oh, wait. Bloop, bloop. Um, if we will turn our eyes and our heart and our affections to God. Take what Jesus did for us and turn it to God. Don't worry about the sin. If you, let, let, let me say this. I'm, I'm supposed to be done. I'm in trouble. Um, I am. I have like 30 seconds to be done. I can't. I'm, I'm just, I'm that guy. I'm going to push the envelope. It's horrible. If you would, if you will give your life to Jesus Christ today, and you will serve him with all your heart, with all your soul, the sin that you have in the presence of a mighty, awesome God will become irrelevant. Don't focus on the sin. If you focus on the sin, what is your affections on? Sin. And God made that irrelevant through his son, Jesus Christ. Focus on God. Let's pray. I thank you, God, for your grace and mercy. I thank you that you set us free. Help us, Lord, to live our lives for you with all our heart, with all our soul. In Jesus' name, amen. 1201. 1201.